Korea, you've joined just in time. Can you say a few words so that we know that you are loud and clear? Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SCAP's regional conversation on equitable access to vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics. We cannot think of a more topical and relevant issue to discuss right now, as we will all agree. My name is Srinivas Tata. I'm the director of the Social Development Division, and I'm honored to be your moderator today. This regional conversation is structured along two segments. The first segment is the high level segment. We have senior luminaries, including Her Excellency Ibu Armida Al Jabana, the Executive Secretary of SCAP, uh, uh, Her Excellency Helen Clark, uh, His Excellency the Vice Minister for Health of Indonesia, Dan, uh, Mr. Dante Saxono, as well as Harbu Wono, and His Excellency Dato Limjok Hoy, SG of ASEAN, who will be uh, giving their views and setting the stage for the high level panel discussion that's going to follow. Where we have five distinguished panelists who will be exploring the different aspects of equitable access to vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics. After which we hope that this will be a highly enjoyable and interactive panel will be followed by open Q&A. So I'm sure we look forward to this very exciting regional conversation. So without much ado, it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Her Excellency Ibu Armida Salsia Alice Jabana, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of SCAP to deliver her welcome remarks. Ibu Armida, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Srinivas. Very good afternoon from Bangkok. Excellency uh, Helen Clark, co-chairperson of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Excellency Pa Dante Saxono Harbuono, Vice, Man Vice Minister of Health of Indonesia. Excellency Dato Lim Jokhoi, Secretary of ASEAN. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our regional conversation on equitable access to vaccine, diagnostics, and therapeutics. This is the most urgent, relevant, and very timely issue facing us right now. This is the third event of our 2021 Regional Conversation Series. These events focus on priority areas where SCAP can support member states in their post-COVID-19 recovery efforts and their journey towards achieving SDGs. As of mid-November 2021, according to the latest WHO data, there were more than 253 million Confirm COVID-19 cases globally, and the mounting death toll exceeded 5 million people. About 60% of the world's registered COVID-19 cases and about 50% of the world's COVID-19 related deaths were in our region. The pandemic has affected every country in the region. It has brought tremendous suffering and loss and affected all aspects of its societies and economies. The continuing rollout of vaccine offers hope. As of mid-November 2021, about 7.3 billion, so 7.3 billion vaccine dosage have been administered globally with about 3 billion fully vaccinated people. In Asia and the Pacific, the rollout has been uneven. Some countries have vaccinated large proportion of their population, while others still lag behind. There are still too few doses available for import because many vaccines are available only in advanced countries. Some countries have benefited from bilateral arrangement with countries that manufacture vaccines in the region. Others have relied on supplies from COVAX, but donations and supplies for COVAX to COVAX facilities have not kept pace with demand. Indeed, a surge 
of COVID-19 cases in recent months, often related to more virulent strains of the virus and relaxed restrictions, highlights the urgency of expanding and ramping up vaccination programs. The new Omicron strain, a variant of concern, just labeled a variant concerned by WHO uh, over the weekend, is a case in point. Vaccine hesitancy due to misinformation and distrust has added to the problem and complexity. The pandemic has also pointed to the acute need for increased investment to strengthen health system and provide universal health coverage, where all people have easy and affordable access to health services without incurring financial hardship. The insufficient investment and weak health system have contributed to higher mortality and slow vaccination rollout in some Asia-Pacific countries. This is aggravated by a lack of testing facilities, diagnostics, and therapeutics. This in turn reminds us that while vaccines are an important tool in the fight against COVID-19, we need to pay equal attention to developing and providing access to faster and more accurate diagnostics and newly emerging medical treatments for COVID-19. The inequities in the supply and distribution of vaccines have highlighted the potential role that regional cooperation can play to facilitate pooling of resources for joint research and manufacture of vaccine and therapeutics and to harmonize policies, procedures to smoothen the flow of life-saving goods. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I draw your attention to export resolution 77-1 of this year in which ESCAP member states recognize that to bring the pandemic to an end, every country must have universal, equitable, and timely access to quality, safe, efficacious, and affordable diagnosis, therapeutics, mm -hmm. medicine, vaccine, and essential health technologies and their components, as well as equipment for the COVID-19 response. So this came from our resolution yeah, as mandated by member states. As an engine of growth and innovation and a global leader in manufacturing, the region, Asia-Pacific, must soon safely open its borders to global travel, restore global supply chain, and enable economic and social recovery. Today, I have the honor to welcome high-level policymakers and distinguished experts from the region to discuss good practices, lessons learned, and next steps in providing fast and equitable access to vaccine, diagnostic, and therapeutics. Therefore, the objectives of the conversation are, firstly, to identify challenges to an initiative in upscaling the production and distribution vaccine, diagnostic, and therapeutics. Secondly, to highlight aspects of health system that need to be strengthened. And thirdly, to discuss how cooperation among various levels of governments businesses and civil society could contribute to enhance equity and access to vaccine, diagnostic, and therapeutics in the region. ESCAP will revisit this topic at its upcoming commission session in May next year, when we will also commemorate our 75th anniversary. So following up on resolution 77-1 of this year, 2021, may I remind everyone to be ambitious, but equally realistic in making proposals and suggesting action. I look, look forward to your insight and further deliberation as well as recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Armida, for setting the stage so well for our conversation in terms of the, your expectations as well as the objectives for this conversation. It is now my honor and pleasure to invite Her Excellency, Ms. Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand and currently co-chair of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response to deliver the keynote address and share her views on effective response to future pandemics and the steps that could be taken for equitable access to vaccines, diagnostics and pharmaceuticals. Excellency, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much to the Executive Secretary for her invitation to me to participate today. And can I uh, greet all uh, participating in this regional conversation, a very important uh, conversation, uh, which obviously takes place in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
which is also a pandemic of inequalities, inequalities between countries and communities when it comes to access to the vital goods needed to fight the pandemic. The emergence of the Omicron variant of COVID has laid these inequalities and injustices bare for all to see yet again. Uh, it has emerged on an, a very lowly vaccinated continent, which has not been able to get equitable access to vaccines. And now we see uh, high income countries who have plenty of vaccine shutting their doors to travelers from those countries where Omicron uh, has taken uh, root. Uh, this has even caused the cancellation of the major WTO ministerial meeting, which was due to start in Geneva yesterday. And it would hardly be reasonable to start that ministerial when South Africa, a major proponent of waiving patent rights over goods like vaccines needed to fight COVID, cannot even attend. Uh, as the executive uh, secretary and, and you, Mr. Moderator, have said, uh, I spent from uh, July last year to May this year uh, working as co-chair of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. We delivered our report to the World Health Assembly in May, and I continue to uh, advocate uh, for its recommendations. We were asked by the World Health Assembly resolution to review the experiences of fighting COVID-19 and to make recommendations based on lessons learned. And I don't intend today to go into the whole gamut of those. I want to zero in on the vaccine issues. But suffice to say, we did find delays and shortcomings in so many areas and recommended a substantial reform package uh, for the international system to uh, consider. Uh, we did call for a special session of the UN General Assembly uh, to agree on a political declaration on the reform package because we see the United Nations as the most inclusive and legitimate of all international organizations, and we think this is where the debate needs to happen. Can I also note the World Health uh, Assembly is meeting in a special session as we speak uh, on the issue of uh, new legal instruments, also part of our package of recommendations, and we'll meet next year on looking at the WHO's specific recommendations. But on vaccines, our panel had both short and long-term things to say. On the short term, we directly addressed this issue of the vaccine inequity, uh, where high-income countries went out and ordered twice as many doses as they needed, which of course has meant that there haven't been enough doses for COVAX, the facility that was set up uh, to uh, be able to distribute uh, doses to uh, low and, and low and middle income countries. Uh, now, a number of promises have been made by high income countries to redistribute uh, surplus stocks. Unfortunately, very little has been redistributed. And this, I think, tells us the shortcomings of a charity model when it comes to addressing uh, these kinds of issues. The IMF uh, estimated uh, just in the middle of this month that, for example, the United States had probably redistributed about a third of what it had promised and the European Union about a third. Well, you can't vaccinate uh, more of the world uh, on, on that. We called, and we believe this was entirely possible, for a billion doses to be redistributed by September this year. Of course, that didn't happen. And for another billion by mid uh, next year. Now, we also recommended to Dr. Tedros that WHO set out a, a strategy with targets on, on what was needed to try to curb the pandemic by way of vaccine rollout. And WHO's target said 10% of the population of every country should be vaccinated by September. Obviously, that didn't happen. They said 40% of the population of every country needs to be vaccinated by the end of this year. I can tell you that latest figures are that 82 countries will not meet that target. Now, you know, it, it, you would have to be a complete fool not to see that if 82 countries can't, can't meet that target of 40%, transmission is rolling on, you know, virtually unhindered, and we run the risk of more lethal, more transmissible variants, uh, more likely to break through uh, vaccine barriers. So this is extremely concerning. And uh, the WHO target was for around the middle of next year, 
for 70% of the population of every country to be vaccinated. Well, if we can't meet the 40%, how do we meet the 70%? Already, senior WHO staff are on the record as saying uh, that this vaccine inequity in itself is contributing to the pandemic hanging on for at least a year longer than it need have, have done. Uh, the COVAX facility, which, as I say, is essentially done on, a, on both a, a charity and a, and a market model, has abandoned its goal of having two billion doses to deliver by the end of this year. Uh, probably the best case scenario is it would be 25% lower than that, maybe not even that. And I can tell you that, uh, that a third of what it's distributing are donations, which of course are far lower than was promised. Meanwhile, we are seeing high income countries actually dumping doses, which they couldn't use themselves and didn't have sufficient supply chain management uh, to get out to countries desperate to access them in time for them to be sensibly able to use them. So, so this is, is absolutely intolerable. Now, we also as a panel called for rapidly scaled up manufacturing around the world's regions, desperately needed. And we said the quickest way to do this is for the pharmaceutical companies uh, to uh, go along with voluntary licensing for local manufacture in developing uh, countries. That would have been the quickest way. There has been far too little of that. We're reading announcements about agreements being entered into, but, but it's too slow. Now, uh, on this call, I'm sure will be many experts who will know that TRIPS, the trade-related um, aspects of intellectual property regulation under WTO, does allow for compulsory licensing. And I would urge countries to consider that. Doesn't mean they don't pay a royalty for using it, but there are provisions in public health emergencies for uh, compulsory licensing. Uh, Obviously, the uh, advocacy of South Africa and India, backed by the vast majority of the world's countries, for a TRIPS waiver for the duration of the pandemic of intellectual property rights across all these goods that we're talking about today, uh, diagnostics, uh, therapeutics, vaccines, uh, this waiver should occur. But it's very slow progress at the, at the WTO. And in my humble opinion... Uh, as a long-time person active in health and a one-time health minister, I think WTO should have a standing waiver uh, of intellectual property rights whenever a pandemic is declared. And that may be something that governments would be interested in, in taking up. Um, so we also had um, a kind of medium-term recommendation and that is we say that the Act A, that's the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, of which COVAX, the vaccine facility, is a part, needs to be completely redesigned on a global public investment and global public goods model with end-to-end -end solutions. We say it's not good enough, and, and clearly the results bear this out, to try to cobble together something based on charity, which may or may not arrive, and, and trying to access markets when there's been export bans and all sorts of barriers uh, to, to countries uh, getting the, the vaccines that, that they need. Uh, can I uh, perhaps uh, draw my comments to a, a close by both encouraging SCAP uh, to support countries to think about regional strategies for ongoing scale up of manufacturing capacity. This is not a one-off global vaccination effort and it is going to drag on well into 2023, unfortunately. So the pandemic will drag on. But you know, the world will need boosters. It will need the upgraded vaccines. You know, we wait news now to see whether Omicron, uh, how much tweaking of the vaccine will be needed. So the one do dose that those lucky enough to have got it might have got at the end of uh, 2020 or sometime this year, it's not going to cut it. The world will need boosters. We will need ongoing capacity. And if countries can build that manufacturing capacity, then, of course, it is there in the event of other pandemics, but also as, as, a, as a tool and, and actually economic sector for the future as well. I want to endorse what the executive secretary said about we need vaccine plus strategies. Vaccines are absolutely indispensable part of ending the pandemic, but it can't do it on its own. Countries do need to keep uh, all those important public health measures at tap in order to calibrate up and down as needed. 
masking, we're just going to have to, to live with that for the, for the foreseeable future. And this is not strange to Asia. When I first visited Asia more than half a century ago, I saw everyone wearing masks, which I've never seen in my country. Asia knew something that the rest of us uh, didn't. The physical distancing, the vaccine mandates, the testing, tracing, isolation, these are all vital tools. One more thing, universal health coverage, absolutely vital to fighting the pandemic. So is universal basic social protection on which the ILO under Michelle Bachelet's leadership of a commission produced a very good report uh, some years ago. It's very hard to lock down and take strong measures when people don't have their, their basic incomes uh, looked after. Uh, so, you know, th th this, this is a wicked problem. But uh, with SCAP, you know, working to bring the views of the region together and start strategizing, I, I feel confident that Asia will continue to lead on the pandemic. We have some of the best examples in the world of responses to COVID in our region. And let's keep it that way and be on the front foot uh, with the strategies around universal access uh, to vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Clark, for your extremely encouraging, riveting, comprehensive and insightful remarks. You've given, I'm sure, our panel a lot to reflect on, and it was really great to hear it from you, you being at the forefront of uh, the thinking on this. So thank you so much for sparing time, and I hope, uh, I know you're a busy person, that you will have time to also listen to part of our panel discussion. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to invite his Excellency, Dr. Saxono Harbuono, Vice Minister for Health of Indonesia, to share his views on the issues faced by countries in our region and the expectations from the multilateral system at large. Indonesia has a special role to play as is the chair of the G20. It also has been leading on the health agenda, both as part of the global health security agenda and also within ESCAP, calling for and equity in the supply of vaccines, diagnostics, and pharmaceuticals. Thank you for your leadership, sir, and we look forward to hearing your views. The floor is yours, Your Excellency. Thank you. Her Excellency Helen Clark, co-chair of the IPPVR, Mrs. Ibu Amida Ali Sahbana, Secretary Executive of UNISCAP, and Dato Lim Jose Hoy, Secretary General of Asian, distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen, no region are more heterogenic than the Asian and Pacific, be geographically, socioculturally, and also economically. The diversity inherent challenge for country in our region to effectively vaccinate our population against COVID-19. And encompassing challenge related supply, distribution, and demand. From the supply side, the limited capacity of the majority country in this region to develop and produce COVID-19 vaccine has caused the country without such capacity to rely on the vaccine produced by manufacturing from the more able country to be purchased or even donated. In this issue, COVAX facility has provided a lifeline to fight against the pandemic by ensuring everyone around the world particularly one in the developing country nation, to have access to life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. In Asia and the Pacific alone, more than 20 low- and middle-income countries have benefited participating in COVAX facility. But is it mechanism sufficient for long runs? It may be, it may, it might not. It has been mentioned in numerous occasions that COVAX are only do their job if vaccinate, if vaccine are made available to them. From vaccination distribution perspective, geographically barrier in the region also present challenge in distributing the mass need counter measure. In many countries, without locally manufacturing vaccine, the journey of vaccine from its manufacturer side to reach the port of entry, then vaccinating site are sometimes come in a great cause. While some international development partners, such as UNICEF and PAHO, able to reduce distribution costs, a more sustainable way to significantly reduce the cost is paramount. For long run, one of the most promising 
and the best buy alternative to address the vaccine supply and distribution capacity in the region is by creating regional effort to diverse the vaccine production, including its critical input supply and require human resources. I expect agency under the UN with their own portfolio and the expertise will have the ability to jointly assist us to advance our collective capacity in vaccine development, manufacturing, distribution, and delivery, among other true. First, encouraging and facilitating transfer of required technology and know-how, including through research and to developing country. And second, promoting mutual beneficiary public partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, as from the demand side point of view, it has been acknowledged that vaccine hesitancy is one of the main drivers for the lack of demand for COVID-19 vaccination. Even if supply and distribution challenges are solved, COVID-19 vaccination program will remain in an effective if the target population is not willing to take steps. To address the root cause of vaccine hesitancy, such as the lack of trust to government and vaccine industry, fear of the side effect, as well as influence wrongful vaccine campaign is equally important to effectively deliver vaccination. Similarly, with the role UN agency can take up overcome the supply and distribution challenge. A similar approach can also be done to address the issue of vaccination hesitancy. Collaboration between the related UN agency, government, and communication practitioner can go a long way to manage this class issue related to vaccination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your remarks. You've clearly identified uh, the issues faced by countries and uh, what kind of support you expect from the multilateral system at large and in particular the UN system. Uh, we will definitely reflect on these remarks. We will now hear from His Excellency Dato Lim Jok Hoi, the Secretary General of ASEAN, on the progress made in the implementation of the strategy and implementation plan for ASEAN vaccine security and central lands and the support required for its implementation. I invite our colleagues to play the pre-recorded message submitted by the ASEAN Secretariat on behalf of the SG. Excellencies, distinguished representative, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. I'm pleased to join you today, regionals conversation, equitable access to vaccine diagnostic and therapeutics. I convey my appreciation to the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific for convening this timely event, which provides an important platform for multi-stakeholders engagement in promoting equitable access to vaccine and other pharmaceuticals and enhancing measures for vaccine rollout initiatives. Vaccination is one of the known public health interventions that is cost effective in preventing infection disease. History has shown the positive impact of vaccine to control, prevent and even eradicate diseases. In ASEAN, initiatives are ongoing to support the Declaration of ASEAN Vaccine Security and Self-Reliance, or AVSSR, which was adopted at the 35th ASEAN Summit in November 2019. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, the timely and equitable access to affordable and quality-assured COVID-19 vaccine have been prioritised in the implementation of the regional strategies on AVSSR. Technical exchanges and critical updates are also being undertaken with various partners relevant to vaccine availability and management. Vaccine rollout in the ASEAN 
has been mobilized either through bilateral engagements or the COVID facilities. Several ASEAN member states, namely Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam, have undertaken steps to ensure vaccine self-sufficiency, particularly through technology transfer and adoption. At the same time, further enhancing the air VSSR requires the need to advance and leverage capacities in research and development, which include evidence-based policy to support the use of appropriate technologies for vaccine management. In this regard, I encourage relevant stakeholders to explore potential areas of engagement which include considering the feasibility of regional pool procurement and stockpiling of vaccine, as well as other therapeutics. In doing so, it is equally important to account for the varieties, the variation in health regulation, and the implication on resource constraints setting. To complement this multi-stakeholder cooperation, a whole of the government approach to digital transformation is imperative in our efforts to realize vaccine security and self-reliance. Indeed, a technology enabler healthcare ecosystem must be at the heart of ASEAN digital transformation agenda, which has been accelerated in response to the pandemic. This has been further implemented through the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework and its implementation plan, which serve as the region's consolidated exit strategy to build back better, stronger, and more resilient. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in closing, ASEAN should continue moving forward in collaborating with external partners in determining the operational steps for the AVSSR. I hope that the discussion today will result in valuable inputs and enable concrete steps to further support countries in promoting access to vaccine, therapeutic and diagnostic. I wish this event every success. Thank you. I thank the Secretary General. I thank the Secretary General for his message and for highlighting the ASEAN perspective and the support required from the UN system and the multilateral system at large. We've now come to the end of the high level segment and we will now move to the panel discussion. We would welcome speakers in the opening segment if they would wish to remain online and join discussions also at the end of the panel discussion. As explained before, we have five distinguished panelists. They're indeed very distinguished and their CVs will be shown on the chat as I provide a short introduction. Our first panelist is Dr. Anne Lindstrand, who is the coordinator of the expanded program of immunization. She's from the World Health Organization and she's also in charge of coordinating supplies to COVAX, two countries as per the national plans. We have Dr. Ben Coglin, the senior health specialist of the health sector group of ADB. He's a public health physician and a medical epidemiologist, epidemiologist by qualification. The third panelist is Dr. Carlos Correa, who is the executive director of South Center, and which is an intergovernmental organization with more than 50 developing country members. He's a renowned expert on health and trade linkages and on access to essential medicines and vaccines. Dr. K. Srinath Reddy is the president of the Public Health Foundation of India, who has also won many awards from WHO and is an expert and on many international national panels on universal health coverage, non-communicable diseases, as well as tobacco control. Last but not least, we have Ms. Annika Schmeider, who is an associate fellow at Chetham House. She has recently coordinated a publication titled Vaccines in the Triple Challenge, outlining the various issues regarding access to uh, vaccines in Asia Pacific and suggested uh, many solutions and for regional cooperation among countries. I'd like to start the discussions by turning first to Dr. Anne Lindstrand from WHO. Dr. Lindstrand, my question to you is, 
what were the challenges that were that have been faced by WHO in ensuring adequate supply to COVAX? And how is WHO overcoming these hurdles? I know it's a big question to cover in four to five minutes, and then we can cover the other issues in the second part. Over to you, Anne. And thank you very much. Um, yes, it's been very complex and um, very frustrating to be inside of COVAX and not be able to deliver on the promises of having this as a global mechanism for solidaric sharing of doses for us to, 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 to stop the pandemic together. And the COVID-19 pandemic is, is really not over, despite now that there is enough vaccine supply, we could have protect, protect, uh, protected 40% of the population. Many health workers and vulnerable populations are still unprotected, uh, unprotected. Oxygen is still lacking. Lack of testing is leaving countries blind to know where the virus is circulating and public health and social me measures really must be maintained. To, Today and, and the, the days before and after, the World Health Assembly is discussing a new uh, treaty on what, uh, you know, how to do and how to plan for the next pandemic. The appearance of the Omicron is a wake up call for us all. And we really, really need a global solidaric um, solution uh, on paper and maybe signed uh, for the next pandemic. Right. And um, so. The Act A accelerator has so far delivered 544 million doses to 144 countries and territories, um, which is an achievement in, in itself. Uh, the world has administered 7.6 billion doses since the beginning of the year or end of last year. This is really an amazing achievement from all countries. And the rapid ramp up now that we see is very, very encouraging. We've never seen any vaccine introduction being done at this scale and speed as, as it is. Um, so Helen Clark was, was really talk, talking about the catastrophic supply constraints that low and middle income countries are still, um, still facing. Uh, we, we're paying the price of vaccine nationalism, of lack of transparency from manufacturers, uh, of unforeseen supply constraints. There's been license, export license bans, production line problems. Um, and then um, many of the high income countries with larger resources jumping the queue in the manufacturing uh, space to get access to the doses first. And this is, this is really discouraging, discouraging, really disheartening. You know, you see, sit inside of COVAX and you feel this is the solution, but the world wasn't playing the game here. Um, every day there are more than six times more additional booster doses being delivered, administered locally, than there are doses administered in low-income countries. Still, uh, AFRO came out with statistics that only one in four healthcare workers in Africa is still protected. So we're far from that global solution, far from finding the right solutions to do the right thing. There are a few key actions that must be taken immediately to be able to, to achieve the WHO vaccination targets. First of all, manufacturers needs to trans be transparent about their delivery schedules and prioritize the deliveries of primary series of vaccinations by shipping doses ordered by COVAX and AVAT immediately. The well-supplied countries must accelerate the delivery of vaccine doses um, that have been pledged to COVAX and do this well, not do it piecemeal and 100,000 doses here and there, but do it you know, in, in an orderly manner so that countries can not get small piecemeal uh, earmarked doses that we have to handle within COVAX, but actually give large portion and predictable supply. Donations must really be this um, unearmarked, predictable, and not short-sighted with short shelf life. That's not working any longer. The high-income countries must also swap their places in the queue with COVAX for the delivery of vaccines. And Switzerland has now announced as one of the first countries in the world now to do that. Uh, which is very, very late in my mind. 
And countries must, of course, also remove all the barriers of exporting of vaccines and uh, vaccine related products. So uh, we know that the world is producing 1.5 billion vaccine doses globally every month. This is enough if we share them equally. I must say that I'm impressed by uh, the WHO Wipro region, which have managed amazingly well. And there is only seven countries that are off track to reach the 40% by the end of the year. Uh, Southeast Asia uh, is struggling more with the still supply for their large populations and five countries are off track for the 40% target by the end of the year. Uh, so the impact of this inequitable vaccine distribution is very simple. There are countries, there are communities where most countries, people are still unvaccinated, where healthcare workers, frontline workers are still unprotected um, and where people are really left vulnerable for this infection and severe disease and death. And more variants of concerns will emerge. The pandemic will ro roll on. Uh, time is running out for to address this inequity and donors must really de deliver now on their promises, unearmarked, very fast. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Lindstrand, in the second round about talk how countries need to prepare better. But I really was touched by your passionate, uh, you know, uh, the way you rendered uh, your own frustrations, but how you're dealing with them in a positive manner. So I, I really thought that uh, that really touched the heart, I'm sure, of all of us listening. Having said that, it's uh, I would like now to turn to Dr. Ben Coughlin, who is the uh, who is from ADB. I like to ask. And Dr. Ben Coughlin, about the ADB's uh, Asia-Pacific Vaccine Access Facility um, that it was set up uh, with a $9 billion uh, corpus. So how many countries have benefited from ADB's APVAX facility? What is this about? What have been the key achievements made in the reason, region from this implementation of this facility? Over to you, Ben. Thanks, uh, Dr. Srinivas. So look, the, the Asia-Pacific Vaccine Access Facility is a $9 billion fund which was established primarily to secure vaccines, procure them uh, for countries, lend countries money to procure them, and then assist in the vaccine delivery. So this came on the back of a $20 billion rapid investment by ADB in April last year to support countries with the immediate response. Now, the, the APFAX, um, this facility, really was a new financing modality established really as a custom-made response to the pandemic. Um, it, it didn't come with some of the ceilings that other lending modalities uh, came with ADB. Uh, it, it was designed with some flexibility that it could be changed and adapted as the pandemic changed. Uh, and it was focused really at a country level. So it allowed countries to say uh, themselves what were their needs in terms of vaccines or in terms of strengthening their own systems and which which element of that? So it came with a rapid response component, which was essentially buying vaccines and then transporting them, delivering them to countries, and a project investment component, which was really earmarked at strengthening the delivery systems, perhaps even expanding manufacturing, although countries haven't really taken that up. Um, but with, I guess, a more medium term uh, uh, ends in mind, that the, the health system strengthening is a core component of vaccine delivery, as we've heard in uh, a number of introductory remarks. Um, to purchase vaccines, this facility really relied on uh, some measure of quality, safety and effectiveness. So there's only three means by which this APVAX facility can purchase vaccines on behalf of our member states. That is if a vaccine's been listed by COVAX, it's considered adequate to purchase with ADV funds. If it's got WHO emergency use listing, or if an SRA and, and a stringent regulatory authority, and WHO was assigned designated six stringent regulatory authorities around the world have approved this vaccine for their own markets. So in all, this AppVax facility has um, uh, delivered $4.3 billion in, in loans to 16 developing member countries out of the 14, 49 who were eligible. So that's five in Central West Asia, four in South Asia, Asia three, two in Southeast Asia, uh, one in East Asia, Mongolia, and four small uh, Pacific states. In addition, we, um, we have a, a co-financing arrangement with COVAX. 
So essentially, we we got frustrated, like like Anne, uh, in our inability to action uh, to to get vaccines through this nine billion billion dollar mechanism. So we went to Covax and agreed on a cost sharing arrangement where we would pull demand from a number of our countries in order to access the, the options that COVAX has on various vaccines. So another $800 million on top of that has come through co-financing co with um, COVAX. So in all, that's $5.1 billion for Asia Pacific vaccine. Uh, 90 million doses have been delivered and another 272 million uh, doses have been secured. Uh, for delivery beginning uh, quarter four this year and quarter one next year. Uh, 114 million doses are through that COVAX cost sharing mechanism. Uh, and there's a further close to $1 billion in pipeline projects for uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia and Philippines. Um, in addition, uh, ADB prides itself on being a knowledge bank. We've given another close to $150 million in technical assistance for things like strengthening the vaccine uh, deployment plans, uh, improving vaccine risk communications, training healthcare workers, um, managing medical waste. Um, our demand assessments uh, for, for these outbacks countries, these 16 countries, that the median level of coverage remains quite low. It's 23% at the beginning of November. We anticipate a need a demand of 2 billion doses through 2022. However, it seems that most countries have secured these demands. So we're not necessarily anticipating much uh, greater um, vaccine procurement through this AppVax facility. However, as um, the Honourable Helen Clark men mentioned, there is going to be an ongoing demand, booster doses, perhaps new vaccines for the foreseeable future. So a recurrent annual demand of at least a billion dollars for Asia, uh, a billion doses for, for Asia Pacific. I might just give two, two comments about this facility and whether it's been successful or not. Um, one is that um, not every country is using AppVax to secure vaccines. They're entering bilateral agreements with manufacturers, uh, which may speak to some of that lack of transparency around how things are done or frustrations with the COVAX mechanism. But it's a little more complicated than that. Um, the latest uh, co-financing offer with COVAX that we offered to countries, some 125 million doses, uh, only around 7 million doses were taken up. So countries are uh, rejecting offers on the table at very good prices negotiated by COVAX. And there's probably many reasons for that, country-specific region reasons that we cannot distill out to necessarily common causes. One could be that they're waiting for the donations. Why should they take a loan from ADB to purchase vaccines? Uh, another could be that the, the vaccines on the table, certainly the mRNA vaccines have been rejected in previous offers because countries lack ultra cold chain um, facilities. Uh, it could be that they're looking more closely now that vaccine supplies uh, are becoming less constrained and they're looking at particular vaccines and saying, is this sufficiently effective? Is, it, is the immunity waning quickly? And they're being more uh, exercising more discretion rather than trying to get vaccines as they were last year. That's even without reaching the coverage targets under the national deployment plans. And just one other thing, just, just to finish, the project investment component of the total uh, 4.3 billion that we've spent to date, only just over 2% has been taken by countries to strengthen their own systems. So this sort of begs the question, are countries really thinking about this in the long term? Have they made that transition to thinking about how they strengthen their systems adequately? Because I think there's an opportunity for us here to, to take that and run with it. Thank you. I think, thank you so much, Ben, for really highlighting the elements of what you're offering. The fact that money is there, but maybe it's not being taken up because of different reasons, but it's being used. And uh, the fact that perhaps they're not spending as much on health system strengthening as they should. So maybe Dr. Reddy can address that to a certain extent. Our next uh, panelist is Dr. Carlos Correa, who's a renowned expert on trade and health and who's now the executive director of South Center. Dr. Correa, my question to you is what are the critical issues with regard to trade and health that need to be addressed within the scope of this pandemic if we are going to ensure equitable access to vaccines <laughs> in all countries? It's a subject on which you have spoken a lot and written a lot. So you've got four to five minutes in the first phase. Maybe it's a short time to tell us about it, please. 
Well, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this conversation. And uh, also thank you for this very pertinent question. Well, there are many aspects uh, that uh, relate to um, this trade and health relationship. One has already been mentioned. It was the disruption in terms of trade of inputs necessary to produce vaccines. For instance, some restrictions imposed in the United States or also restrictions to the export of vaccines themselves. But I will focus on another issue, and this is uh, also a trade-related issue, which is technology, and in particular, appropriation of technology. As you know, one of the important agreements in the context of the World Trade Organization is the TRIPS agreement, the agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights, which creates a framework in order to allow for the appropriation of technology. And technology has been a key issue in the context of COVID-19. In particular, the fact that uh, the companies that uh, were first in developing vaccines were not willing to uh, share the technology. So the, the shortage of supply, um, the, the lack of uh, timely delivery of vaccine is, is related to the lack of sharing technology. And this is, I think, the, one of the main issues we need to address in the context of this pandemic and in the context of future pandemic if they arise. So the TRIPS agreement ensures that um, inventors get patents granted. Patents imply the legal monopolies. This is not a political statement. The jurisprudence in the United States and Europe, Europe consider that a patent grants a legal monopoly. Uh, and therefore, technology can, cannot be used uh, without the consent, the authorization of the right owners. And this has been one of the reasons for the shortage of supply and also the lack of willingness to uh, share um, know-how, which is critical in the case of biological products, such as um, the case of vaccines. Then all this, this happened despite three, three, uh, three issues that I would like, three observations I'd like to make. The first one is that Technologies to produce vaccine, uh, at least some type of them, such as the so-called conventional technologies, are well known. But um, there is a need to get uh, rapid access to know-how and clinical data in order to expand production. And this was not done. In the case of the messenger RNA technology, which is this uh, new technology, in fact, uh, there have been claims by the companies that have developed vaccines on the basis of this technological platform about the investment they made to develop it. But it's interesting to know that the messenger and the technology was developed by public and private universities. The development took uh, almost uh, three decades. Uh, the, the initial concept was, in fact, introduced by a graduate student. Robert Malone in uh, 1987, and after that, hundreds of scientists have worked in developing the mRNA te technology. Um, in, in fact, the British Columbia University also developed the nanoparticle peptide that uh, is essential for the administration of uh, this vaccine. So this has been this has been the outcome of a collective effort of so universities such as Harvard, University of California. Um, the University of Duke, uh, Turbingen in, in Germany, they have all cooperated and, and made contributions in order to develop this, this technology. But then uh, there was this claim that it could not be shared. And of course, it was just to protect commercial interests and not to uh, enhance access to, uh, to vaccines in a timely manner. So the second, the second observation is that at the very beginning of this pandemic, the Secretary General of the United Nations indicated that uh, products needed to address COVID-19 should be considered as global public goods. And this was echoed by many head of states at the World Health Assembly that took place in 2020. But this has not happened. So uh, these products continue to be subject to uh, proprietary rights. And this has been uh, critical in, uh, in preventing um, countries from getting timely access to vaccines and other products. And the third observation is that in the context of the work organization, a pool of technologies was established. It was initiated by the president of Costa Rica. The acronym is CTAP. And then uh, there has been only one contribution to this pool, uh, very recently done by the Council of Scientific Research of Spain, 
and this is about the diagnostic kit, is not a vaccine. But the companies uh, have, have, been have been against, have refused to share the technology. And, and this is a problem. And it is not a situation in which know-how cannot be developed by other companies. It can be developed. The, the, the problem is that it takes time. So what was needed is sharing technology in a timely manner in order to expand production also in order to allow a timely access to the vaccine. So many, many, many companies in Bangladesh, for instance, in Canada, they requested license to uh, the Western companies uh, to add technologies. They, they were refused. There, were, there, there are many plants, uh, including those that produce biologicals, that can be repurposed in order to produce vaccine, both in developed and developing countries, but they were not able to do that because the lack of technology, the lack of uh, rapid access to know-how. Um, the mRNA technology now is being used also in, uh, in China and in Thailand to develop their own vaccines without the help of the companies that already possess the technology. So this is another, another evidence that this can be done, but it takes time. So I think this is one of the main issues that have emerged in the context of trade and health. I fully agree with the concept by Ellen Clark. We, should, we cannot rely on charity. We cannot rely on donations of vaccines. There was an opportunity for many countries to contribute in the manufacturing of vaccines. This has not happened. And this is clearly related to the disciplines that now apply in relation to technology in the context of trade agreements. So thank you very much again. For the opportunity Thank you very to much. We'll come Thank back you. to you in the second round of our broader to rethink about the whole intellectual property regime. But thank you very much for identifying the issue of technology as being one of the most critical issues that needs to be addressed. Uh, it takes us very nicely into the next uh, uh, to the uh, next panelist, who is Dr. K. Srinath Reddy, who is uh, an expert on health systems, universal health care. Dr. Reddy, the pandemic has placed the focus on strengthening health systems, including, including increasing funding for them in a region where investment in health has not reached the desired proportions, in fact, well below uh, 5% as, as a percentage of GDP. What are the options for government in, governments in the region now? There's a momentum now to increase funding. What are the options and what are the steps that you think are imperative in the short and medium terms? So over to you, Dr. Reddy. Well, firstly, the pandemic, which has been very prolonged, almost over two years, has given much greater attention and gained priority for health. So this is an opportunity that must be seized by those who are asking for additional funding for health sector within the government. But I believe as far as funding is concerned, we firstly need increased funding for the health sector activities but we also need allocative and utilization efficiencies within the sector. So reprioritization within the sector is going to be important. The third element is try steer and synergize allocations in other sectors towards influencing the determinants of health, which will support the initiatives of the health sector and advance public health objectives even through other sectors. So we need not focus only on the health sector budget for that reason. Now, in terms of the health sector itself, clearly there has to be an increased allocation from tax revenues through government funding, particularly for strengthening the public sector health services and even for strategic purchasing of services from the private sector if it is being partnered. So whether it is taxation income from income con or consumption or profit, property or imports, we certainly need an increased allocation from both federal and provincial governments. Uh, particularly in a federal structure, it should not only be the federal budget that should be focused on, but also the provincial budgets, and we must mobilize more funding from all sources. Then, of course, we do need better tax collections in order to expand the general revenue pool, even if there are no earmark taxes, we ought to make sure that the general revenue pool is increased and therefore the uh, proportional allocation to the health sector can be increased as well. But certainly we can also look at certain taxes being specifically geared towards mobilizing additional resources for health, like, for example, consumption taxes on tobacco, alcohol, 
uh, ultra processed foods sugar sweetened beverages luxury vehicles all of these are also helpful not only in reducing the consumption for better public health objectives of goods that are injurious to health but can mobilize resources which can be steered towards health and we know that philippines for example has utilized the additional revenues from tobacco taxes 85% for health and 80% of that for universal health coverage then we can also look at innovative taxes like tobin tax which is a financial transaction tax but certainly as we are seeing that there is a international health financing transition with reduced international donor assistance countries will have to look at how best they can mobilize more domestic revenues as well in terms of the additional element as to how best we can actually have better allocative and utilization efficiencies within the health sector we need to encourage risk pooling with large risk pools with single payer uh, systems and pool public procurement certainly for the public sector but there is no reason why a pool common procurement system cannot also be shared with the private sector so that if there is a private sector that's being particularly financed from the public revenues or even otherwise having that kind of a pool procurement using the monopsonic power of pool procurement cannot reduce the prices and the costs of care so we need efficiency gains as well as equity focus in health and equity focus within the health sector too we need to ensure that there is both horizontal equity of services being provided in common to all sections of the people but additional services and additional resources to reduce the pre-existing health equity gaps and focusing on the vulnerable groups so both the horizontal and vertical dimensions of equity must be must be addressed and third of course is that allocations within other sectors which are particularly aligned and influential in shaping health should also be steered in so that whether it is education or environment or urban design and urban planning all of them must converge towards public health objectives therefore in totality we'll get uh, overall resource allocation enhancement for health thank you very much dr reddy for your very comprehensive and structured response i think you stressed on looking at the multi sectoral dimension of health including addressing determinants and when we talk about increasing funding for health look at Uh, funding the different also funding it in different sectors we now move to our final panelist who is dr anika schmeider for the, her first question in this round is uh, dr schmeider in a recent publication um, that you did uh, you are associate fellow in chatham house and you coordinated a publication on uh, the uh, on vaccines and the triple challenge what are the key reasons for the inequities in distribution of vaccines and diagnostics that you noticed when you did research and interviewed experts could you let us know in the next 4 to 5 minutes thank you um and what a rich discussion um i'd like to uh take the opportunity i think to draw a few threads together from the conversations that we've had particularly from the opening remarks um Helen Clark and some of the panelists as well in the framework of resilience so we've been supporting research for the um resilience commission um and the commission itself co-chaired by Malcolm Turnbull who's from the Asia Pacific as you will mostly know um resilience has been defined as the ability of systems to adapt innovate and evolve um and working closely with the OECD mid-year we worked on a definition of resilience by intervention which is largely what we're talking about on this panel has been the interventions ne- necessary during this health emergency and how they've panned out but the OECD also defines resilience as being by design so this speaks more to the long term foundations that are needed in order that countries regions and our global systems have resilience so just wanted to provide you with that context because in her opening remarks Helen Clark um made the comment about short term and a long term view and very much this research for the resilience commission has focused on not only the short term but what is needed for long term resilience as well so to that end the co-chairs in june 2021 made a call for global um vaccine equity and following on that we've released this research report um which identifies vaccines in asia pacific as really crucial 
obviously, to short-term resilience, but also to long-term resilience as variants emerge and as COVID becomes endemic in the region. And so it's this view about how the region evolves, adapts and innovates, which has been important for framing this research. Um, in the report, we identify three main policy challenges which have been affecting resilience. We call these the triple policy challenges. First, most countries and jurisdictions have obviously been challenged in accessing vaccines, which has been the impact of multiple, multiple factors we've heard here today. Also, existing global concentration in R&D and supply manufacturing, coupled with emergency policy decisions which have affected supply but it's also an important observation, uh, and this might be a little controversial on the panel, we can talk about this, but it's also an important observation that there was a lack of prior agreement in many areas about how distribution and redistribution of public goods like vaccines and dr other drugs um, would happen during a health emergency. So this has had also a continuing impact on distribution. And as we've heard today on this panel and in the opening remarks, um, COVAX is still struggling to distribute. And in our view, COVAX is really key to resilience and future resilience, and that the global agreements and discussions around how COVAX, COVAX operates for the short, medium and long term are very important. Um, so that's one observation. This research also highlighted that access and distribution um, was challenged also by domestic rollouts. We've also heard this today from um, the Asia Development Bank, um, which is the result obviously of inadequate health infrastructure in many cases, vaccine hesitancy and misinformation and disinformation. And these three factors together have a very strong impact on vaccine rollout in most countries in the region and indeed globally. Um, so a further observation we made in the report was that there was poli also what we call policy hesitancy towards vaccines, um, particularly vaccines which have been approved using emergency regulations in other countries. Um, but beyond understanding simply the challenges, the policy research report also sought to understand the innovations and adaptations that the region has taken. And we found that there'd been quite a series of dynamic um, actions in the region. Many countries are of course renowned for their in initial public health actions based on their experience of SARS. Um, and during the pandemic, the region has also developed uh, flexible sharing mechanisms, which is what we've called them, um, including direct donations, swaps and other bilateral approaches. Um, I think important for me as a political economist, the jurisdictions are also using economic development policies and their science, technology and um, innovation capacity to seed greater manufacturing capacity within their borders and also within the region. And this is an important feature that goes beyond health policy alone. So as the report identifies, this brings a further policy challenge, um, which is to improve regional approaches to health and economic policy foundations, which will support greater resilience by design in the region during health emergencies. So what's needed for greater resilience in Asia Pacific? The research shows that vaccines are the key to resilience and there's a need to consider how regional structures can complement and strengthen both country and global approaches. And regions are really critical to this. So I'm really excited to be speaking at the UNSCAP today on this. Um, equitable vaccine distribution is a priority, obviously, as, it, as COVID becomes endemic. Um, and the Asia Pacific could continue to explore its own uh, approaches to vaccine sharing, procurement and distribution, as has been spoken about today. Um, however, we advocate that mechanisms for trading vaccines particularly should complement and not replace um, manufacturing and distribution efforts through COVAX. Um, health and economic policy structures are very important and our report place, proposes that regional cooperation to uh, strengthen key policies, such as those surrounding vaccine rollouts across the region, um, are important and proposes that Asia Pacific may benefit from a multi-sectoral regional resilience strategy, for example, focusing on strengthening regional policy making and regulatory inst institutions to provide greater support. So thank you. Thank you, Annika. Actually, um, thank you for stopping just there because I was uh, going to ask uh, you to elaborate on the regional cooperation part in the second round. So I think you covered the ground beautifully in setting mm -hmm. the stage for that. 
And so thank you, Annika. So we've come to the end of the first round of questions. We're going to go for a second round to all the panelists with slightly shorter, I'll request slightly shorter answers so that we also have a time for Q&A from the audience. So um, I just want to inform the audience that after the second round, we'll be opening up the Q&A. So feel free to enter your questions in the chat box and people on the MS teams can raise your hands after the finishing of the second round. I now turn again to Dr. Lindstrand. Dr. Lindstrand, what are the challenges that need need to be addressed within countries. I know that one is the, the challenges of procurement of vaccines are important, but how do countries need to prepare better in order to deliver vaccines and in the context of the big load of delivery that's going to come in 2022 with, I think, an enhanced supply of vaccines, hopefully, how can countries do better? How can they prepare better? If you can answer that uh, briefly, it would be great. Yes, we are fast moving from the pivotal time of, of supply constraints uh, to the uptake, uptake search uh, uh, constraints and particularly in some countries. Uh, so um, COVAX uh, will be delivering uh, around 800 to 1 billion doses by the end of the year and the same amount in Q1 2022. So it's really a sharp, sharp increase right, right now. And um, all low-income countries are very, very well aware of this surge of supply that finally uh, will come uh, true and be real from COVAX and AVAT and other, other suppliers. And the planning, you can say, is stage in countries now is very, very intense. Most countries in low-income countries are either in the midst of campaigns or planning uh, intensification and, and planning of implementation of, case, uh, of campaigns soon. And I, I think that we are going to very, very soon see a surge of uptake on and, and delivery of all these preparations that have been going on um, and the last couple of even weeks, you can say. Um, so the COVAX partners were pivoting toward away from developing the NDVP, the global guidance, the trainings, et cetera, into really looking at two priority countries and see what is lagging and what is uh, hindering them for uh, uh, an efficient uh, rollout. Uh, one of the things that I did, and I want to reiterate again, that countries really have been struggling with the unpredictable, unsteady supply. Uh, it's a huge challenge for countries to even be able to plan and implement vaccine delivery strategies if they don't know what's coming at them, right? And even mobilizing and leveraging the national and multilateral fundings in time uh, when you don't have the foresight of, of the full shipment when it's coming. It's really, really important for donors to not give out uh, doses with short shelf life um, because, of course, we've seen that some countries actually have pushed uh, shipments beyond and to Q1 because of that, because they struggle. It's difficult to say, um, you know, and particularly we see that something like 10, 15 countries will probably be struggling even going in uh, through to the end of next year, being able to reach the different goals. Um, and um, the, the, the main bottlenecks, we have um, um, seen many, many countries lessons learned from their interaction review, uh, global webinars, discussion with countries. The main bottlenecks that countries still are seeing apart from the supply is lack of political attention. I think it's fading away. Uh, but weak coordination mechanisms and um, lack of operational funding still, having funding available for the operational teams, limited healthcare worker search for the campaigns. You don't have enough people actually out there. Uh, multiple products in country with short shelf life arriving at short notice, still a problem. Um, and also the evolving evidence because we are changing all the time the policies, right? Because we know more about all these different vaccines. The cold chain capacity, alter cold chain uh, equipment, and as been mentioned many times here, the lack of trust and acceptance and particularly preferential uh, product uh, hesitancy, which is also very much difficult to plan then the campaigns with this um, uh, preferences. Uh, also uh, a lack of existing data and monitoring systems so that you can have real time information about where the go dose is going, where they're not going, how can they re be reallocated and, and uh, shipments be, be uh, planned within countries. 
And so a few factors of success is really the high political leadership um, and uh, having a kind of emergency operating style approach, daily meetings, looking at the data, quick realization, reallocation of doses when uh, and an increase of the number of sites and take decisions fast based on real time data. Uh, it's also bringing the vaccines closer to communities. In the start, there was really a few sites in maybe the urban cities. Now it's really moving towards much mass vaccination centers and mobile clinic outreach, having many more sites. Um, one piece which is a success factor is really and really, really important. Communicate proactively with community and being very consistent, having uh, messages that people trust and um, building on the evidence that we have and plan all the assets very strategically. So as some supply ramps up and WHO and COVAX partners now continue to try and support low and middle income countries to uh, direct technical assistance and support to countries in delivery of uh, vaccination. Uh, what we try to do is also coordinate and collaborate among all the key stakeholders about resolving the bottlenecks, monitoring the progress uh, daily, daily and coordinate information both to funders and to implementers to be able to have up to date information and uh, looking and addressing the key research policy, safety and regulatory issues that still um, is affecting the optimized uptake and monitoring and reporting on the on the progress. I wanted to link back just my last sentence uh, to Benjamin and many of the speakers before. Um, the vaccine scale up right now uh, requires really an unprecedented search in capacity of health workforce and the health systems and the immunis immunization systems itself. And we have seen and we're monitoring the effect on this, on routine immunization, on essential health services. And there is a large impact. We're going to pay the price on the other side for children not being vaccinated, um, and uh, which is which is really um, really a sad story in the in the in the you know shadow of the pandemic response. This pandemic has raised not just between countries and within countries inequities, but also inequities increasing in routine vaccination of children. So really an investment using all the resources that are now are available. We have highlighted the needs for strong health systems to be able to live, deliver these vaccines, routine vaccines and the next pandemic vaccines. And I, I think that we need, really need to, as a global community, double down and really use the resources coming up now, convincing the countries to invest in the weakest um, spots in their countries, build out primary health care and build out immunization services to build for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. I think uh, you've kind of listed out all the challenges and definitely what country should focus on. Moving on to the, uh, Ben Coughlin now. Ben, I'm just moving to a different aspect to what, uh, what was presented by uh, Anne. What are ADV's long-term plans to finance equitable access to, uh, to, uh, to vaccines, especially through building capacity for local manufacturing distribution, which is uh, a key issue that many countries are uh, concerned with? And what is the role of regional cooperation? Uh, if you could keep your uh, answer within three minutes, it would be good So that. Thank you. Sure, thank you for the question. So I guess in terms of manufacturing, I'm not sure there is a grand strategy yet okay to be to be frank i think we're also um grappling with what manufacturing development uh, capability means and and we're kind of bundling up you know the emergency response uh, the need for future preparedness and you know general health system strengthening with recognition now that i guess manufacturing of, of vaccines or therapeutics is a core pillar of health security and, and one that i guess we haven't paid much attention to historically we are, we are mindful of, of many of our member states wanting to develop a sovereign capacity for vaccine manufacturing. Uh, I guess we're trying to temper that with the, the, the complexities of getting up and started, the timelines to get up and started. You know, will there be a viable product at the end of it? How do you create a new manufacturing capacity which is sustainable in, in the short and longer terms? Um, so that's that getting back to the executive secretary comment, you know, tempering the, the ambition and the realism and, and where do the investments need to go in the public sector, the private sector 
or a mix of both. So I think this is necessitating lots of conversations at the country level initially, because every country is saying we were short on supply, we need to address this and ruin it for the future. However, I'm mindful of also what the Executive Secretary of ASEAN said in that these things are only likely to be sustainable where we can pull resources, pull demand. Um, so it is more likely, we suspect, that regional solutions could be more viable. Um, the ASEAN statement on, on vaccine security gives us a nice pathway and ASEAN obviously has plans to establish a centre for public health emergencies and emerging diseases which gives a regional platform, much like, I guess, African CDC, housed within the African Union, to develop coherent responses uh, in terms of manufacturing. We need to mirror such a thing in, in our other um, regions of ADB, Central West Asia, South Asia. Um, so, look, what, we're working on many fronts, basically, to try and uh, address this shortfall in manufacturing that has, has you know, unfortunately resulted in such vaccine inequity. One is, is the regulatory environment and strengthening that, um, that Annika mentioned. Um, so we have established a regional vaccine advisory group uh, consisting of 12 national regulatory authorities who are helping us unlock the bottlenecks for use of our outfits to purchase vaccines and to build vaccine manufacturing capacity. Interestingly, the regulators are quite cautious on rapid tech transfers at this time. They haven't seen it gone well in, in places like Canada. Uh, and they are worried that a fast-tracked approach could lead to substandard, without a longer-term plan and, and a clear plan, uh, we, we may end up with facilities that, that don't meet relevant standards. Um, I guess against that, we're, we're hearing calls from the private sector in some countries with strong support from national governments about developing that Indigenous capacity. So we are exploring how we look at funding, lending to manufacturers within Asia-Pacific um, to bolster this capability. We're also talking to a number of key players here and, and trying to learn from how this, you know, the bioentech transfer of mRNA capacity to Senegal, Rwanda and South Africa um, on the African continent. They are a little more, um, I guess, ambitious in scope, suggesting that it can be done. It can be done well. Uh, the facilities themselves are the least of the problem. It's all of this auxiliary support, the regulatory environment, the human resources, that need to be considered in totality. So we are working with them to, to see if there are ways of fast tracking that. And we're working with the Korean government to develop um, uh, the, uh, the training courses for the human resources that would need to come to develop that. Um, uh, on those, uh, Dr. Reedy mentioned the sort of, um, the larger role of other sectors in, in driving public health, the public health agenda. So our, a 10-year strategy from 2018, uh, strategy 2018 it's called, really talks about a 1AD approach. So every um, pipeline project now has a health lens put over it. So we're thinking really in the longer term, uh, not just vaccine manufacturing, but all the other components for strong systems, how can other sectors play a key role? And if you look at ADB financing, they are a larger share of the pie compared to health, which sits, has sat at around 2%. Uh, there is an ambition to increase health spending overall for ADB up to 6 to 10%. So I think we're in a milieu of optimism where we're pushing um, for, for health, um, but the details for vaccine manufacturing, I think we really need um, more discussions around this. Thanks. It's an evolving situation, like uh, you said, Ben, and it has to be seen in the context how things develop, country capacity, the different models, and very clearly regional cooperation has a big role to play. So... Um, that um, my next uh, uh, my question for Dr. Correa is uh, to follow up on what you explained specifically with regard to this pandemic is what kind of changes do you envisage should be put in the global intellectual property regime if we are to promote increased capacity for vaccine manufacture in uh, a greater number of countries? If you could. Yeah, all right. So there are changes at the international level and also at the national level. At the international level, it was already mentioned by Helen Clark. As you know, there is an initiative for what is called the waiver for the TRIPS agreement, which is submitted by, by India and South Africa. Still, uh, there is no agreement on that after more than one year of uh, discussions. But the waiver will not change the system. It will just suspend uh, for a period 
the um, obligations and the TRIPS agreement in relation to COVID-19 uh, related technologies was already mentioned. So this is not a change in the system itself, but still without being a chain, uh, there is a significant opposition by some countries, in particular European Union and other developed countries. So in terms of changing the system at the international level, I would say that one, one issue has been uh, clear uh, in connection with uh, the use of compulsory licensing as a mechanism in order to enhance manufacturing capacity and access to technology, is that the system that was established in Article 31 b of the CHIPS Agreement, which is a special system for compulsory licensing for pharmaceuticals, is, is, is not a system that works. It is very cumbersome, there are too many conditions, the potential exporters of medicines are not interested because they, they, there are many risks in, in engaging in using the system. So there is a need to review that. And in fact, the European Union um, has made it clear that there is a need to clarify some of the aspects of this. So this is one, one of the aspects of the possible reform that may enhance the capacity of members of WTO to operate in the context of a pandemic. The second one is the possibility to consider that um, when there is an export, even if there is a patent in the exporting country, this is not an infringement of the patent. So this will be an exception under Article 30 of the TRIPS Agreement. And then uh, the, the European Union introduced recently some am amendment to uh, a patent-like uh, right. And, and this is an interesting precedent. So I think it might be possible also to look at this possible solution. And thirdly, it may be necessary to look at some standards of review, uh, some standard for interpretation of TRIPS agreement, when there are cases that are dealt with by panels or the upper body in WTO. So far, these panels have used uh, trade-related jurisprudence, which is not really applicable in the case of intellectual property. So this is another possibility. At the national level, just to, to end, there are there is there is a need to uh, effectively use the flexibilities and trips agreement in particular the compulsory license or government use paradoxically the country that has done the largest use of these flexibilities is the united states where thousands of patents have been subject to compulsory license and government use but sometimes developing countries are afraid of using these mechanisms or they may be subject to um, pressures by, by some governments in order not to do that. And it's important to confirm that these flexibilities are available. They were confirmed by the DOCA declaration on the CHIPS agreement and public health that was adopted almost 20 years ago. So this needs to be done. In some cases, there is a need to streamline the, the procedures, which uh, sometimes are cumbersome. For instance, some countries, there is an appeal when a compulsory license is granted, this needs to be removed. So there is a lot of work to be done also at the national level in order to promote uh, further manufacturing capacity and access to technology. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Correa. I think you've kind of outlined it very clearly for us. I now turn to Dr. Srinath Reddy. Dr. Reddy, in the longer term, it's not just financing. How can health systems be reformed to respond to risks in a more agile manner and address the triple burden of diseases as it's popularly called communicable, non-communicable and emerging? And how can the wider UN system, and there's a plug-in for us here, uh, support member states in this regard? If you can explain very briefly in three minutes, sir. I know it's a big answer to give in a short time. Well, uh, certainly I believe it's absolutely important that we restructure our health systems to become more efficient, equitable, and empathetic. It is not just that they should be resilient health systems and learning health systems. They should also be anticipatory and adaptive right from the beginning. Therefore, it's not just a reactive response, but a proactive planning. And for that, I believe it is absolutely important that we have a primary healthcare-led system of universal health coverage, which provides comprehensive care at all levels of care. We recognize even from the pandemic that communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, mental health, they're all interlinked in every manner. We are seeing syndemics where the virus is actually infecting the body, but claiming the lives of people who have non-communicable diseases like hypertension, 
chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or cardiovascular disease in much larger numbers. So we really can't separate out these and we need to provide comprehensive services. And for this, we must ensure that even in a mixed health system, the public sector is substantially strengthened. And therefore, the, we need at the primary care level, as well as across the other layers of the health system, comprehensive, continuous, and connected care, which can provide both chronic and acute care. And therefore, we also require an investment, not just in infrastructure and equipment and medicines, but in a multi-layered, multi-skilled health workforce. And here, non-physician healthcare providers who are technology enabled are going to be pivotal both for rural and urban primary health care, and that's absolutely important. And certainly, we should use digital health to our maximum advantage, and not as a substitute for the health workforce, but to supplement and enhance their skills and ability to reach out to people. So I believe it's absolutely important that we also supplement it, ensure that there is adequate community engagement, which has been a missing element of the health system, and also focus on how to actually align the social determinants of health into the health agenda. So it's actually a UHC plus agenda that we need to pursue. And therefore, we do require what I believe is a, a digitally enabled district level decentralized decision making, which should be possible uh, in a sense, uh, we ought to really decentralize everything to that extent. And secondly, we need people partner public health. And that level of community engagement is also critical. And I believe the UN system can particularly provide a great deal of support in aligning multi-sectoral engagements in a meaningful manner and ensuring that we all pursue a common agenda for enhancing public uh, health in all dimensions. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy, for your um, succinct remarks. May I now move to um, our last panelist for the last question of this round. Annika, you uh, stop short. Uh, can you share your ideas of how regional cooperation can help in the uh, enhanced uh, in enhancing equity in terms of vaccine uh, distribution as well as those of medicines and diagnostics? If you can be brief, it'd be great because I want to open up for questions. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I just want to preface my comments that I've worked at national level, regional level, also global level uh, when I was working at the WHO. So I want to structure my comments along those lines and provide food for thought, again, drawing together all these different um, areas. So I think at the country and regional level, promoting resilience. Um, I mentioned before the, the idea of resilience by design and by intervention, and I think this is a useful policy framework. I've shared the OECD submission to the Commission in the comments if you want to look. Um, and I think, for example, from this perspective, what we promoted in our June research report was that countries and at regional level can promote this, that health and environment are actually assets from an economic perspective. So investment in health and environment as assets is a really important policy concept that can, can be changed. Um, and also, I guess, along with that, then from that perspective of health and environment as assets, what policy foundations are needed? And I think this, this panel has really highlighted some of those issues. Um, I think along with that, though, at the regional level, promoting policy coherence end to end. So not only promoting um, economic incentives for for companies to invest in manufacturing in particular countries, but making sure that the regulatory system is strengthened alongside of that so that there's quality and standards that are achieved and the policies are coherent. I see this as a really, really important um, framework for regional cooperation. So uh, particularly in the common areas of interest between health and economic policies, which I think we've already mentioned, science, technology and innovation, economic development, and of course, the health lens. I just want to reflect on the health lens for a little moment. And I think our last speaker really nailed this. Health as itself and work from Chatham House provided to the commission really um, spoke to this. Health as itself can be quite fragmented as a policy area internally. Um, and from this perspective, I think uh, the alignment, uh, as we understand it based on pandemic experience between population health, public health, 
health security, health care. There's been a lot of focus on health systems as a, a major um, you know, a means of measuring how we're going with the pandemic. But as we reflected in the previous speaker, you know, population health, public health, really key components of this health security also. So this this alignment of health as a um, as a coherent policy package. Um, regulatory policy, I've mentioned strengthening manufacturing capacity as it develops. Um, we have the emergency use list from WHO, which was mentioned previously, but I think our research really highlights how um, these emergency use, the regulatory approvals that go with them between different countries probably could do with harmonisation in order that there's trust between countries about what's being um, what's being put onto the market and onto the onto the list. Um, and finally, um, I'm going to make a pitch here that we need better attention to global public goods for resilience. The AstraZeneca vaccine, for example, was developed with some properties of global public goods. We know it wasn't procured and distributed along those lines for various reasons. And this is not to point fingers at companies or anyone in particular, just to say that we don't have a process around this. Um, and so I think this is something that's very fruitful, could potentially be discussed and um, promoted at a regional level, for example, with the ideas that might surround that. Um, and we have, again, some of the global mechanisms um, that are important to that. That'd be my five comments. Thank you so much, Annika, for being so structured and disciplined and fitting in your response so beautifully. So, friends, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to end at the end of this very stimulating two rounds of uh, responses from our distinguished panelists. And I, for my, uh, was so transfixed by the responses. We have a little, we have about, uh, we're slightly over time, a little less than 30 minutes for an open discussion. Those wishing, we have some questions already from YouTube, but those wishing to ask a question may kindly send the question again in the chat box. And those on MS Teams, please uh, raise your hand. But I'll use my moderator privilege to go back to Ms. Clark, who's stayed with us, and I'm very honored. Ms. Clark, do you have any, having heard our panelists, do you have any questions for them or any additional thoughts that you'd like to kind of add to what's been said? Well, thank you very much, and really a, a terrific and expert panel, and I, I've learned a lot myself from uh, from listening. Uh, I wanted to uh, build on what uh, Annika uh, said, uh, no, Anne Lindstrom said uh, earlier on about the the rollout of the vaccines and for those countries who haven't yet had the opportunity to, to do a big rollout, to be ready uh, as the supply becomes available, as supply will become available. It's just been too slow to stop uh, this pandemic being being protracted. Now, the fact that rollout has been delayed in many countries uh, has given plenty of time for fake news, misinformation, outright lies about vaccines to take root. And I, I noted in a recent um, article in The Economist on this, that in a survey in Burkina Faso in West Africa, 42% of people responded uh, that they believed that uh, COVID was introduced to their country by foreign agents, and 50% believed that Africans were being used as guinea pigs for vaccines. Now, you can see that's not a very conducive atmosphere in which to be doing a rollout when you eventually get the vaccine. So I think there's really got to be very, very strategic uh, communication strategies now through voices that people trust. And remember, trust in government isn't a universal phenomenon, to put it mildly. Some countries have a lot of trust in their governments, some have none at all. Uh, so finding who those voices are that people will trust, and often those will be peer support voices. I'll just end with uh, a comment on this with respect to my own country, because by and large, the communication has been very good. But when you come to rolling out vaccines that need to go out to everybody, you have to find ways of delivering to the most marginalized in the country. They may be the homeless. They may be people who are using drugs and don't want to come into any uh, contact with the authorities. They may be you know, people uh, who are extremely poor, not on the radar. In New Zealand, the indigenous uh, people's rate of vaccination is much lower. So really finding those trusted voices 
who can help carry the vaccine to every corner of the land is going to be absolutely critical. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Clark, for those additional comments. We have uh, one hand up. I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Rob Yates, who's the executive director of the Center for Universal Health of Chatham House. Rob, can you uh, switch on your camera and just ask your question to the panel, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, my, my question is actually for, for uh, Professor Reddy. Um, we've seen throughout history that, that universal health coverage reforms have often come out of crises, you know, not least here in the UK. And I think Helen Clark has mentioned the situation in New Zealand coming out of the Great Depression. I'm just wondering what you think might be happening in India now. We, we've seen that the recent national health accounts have suggested that public spending has just inched up to 1.35% of GDP, but that's clearly not sufficient for the primary healthcare driven UHG reforms that you'd like. Do you see this crisis potentially resulting in a big increase in public financing in India? And this may be becoming a, a big election issue next time round. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. As you rightly pointed out, uh, there have been several uh, times when the countries have actually implemented universal health coverage after a crisis period, whether it is the UK after the Second World War or Japan in the 1960s or the South Southeast Asian countries after the financial crisis, uh, we've seen that happen quite often. Uh, as far as the in Indian scenario is concerned, the report that you're referring to is the National Health Accounts of 2017-18, which precedes uh, the pandemic. During the pandemic itself, several decisions have been taken to increase the allocations to health. Uh, there has been a huge infrastructure mission that has been announced just a few weeks ago, apart from uh, increased allocations in the budget uh, this year. And there's a national digital health mission as well. Of course, we need uh, also to focus on the health workforce. But I believe that uh, given that the pandemic is now really putting a lot of policymaker attention, as well as public demand on increased resources for health, I believe we are going to be seeing a greater spending on health. Uh, that, unfortunately, is the only fringe benefit of this pandemic. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Reddy. I now uh, would like to give the floor to Ms. Cecilia O, oh, who's a global uh, advisor on a project which is run by uh, UNDP, along with WHO in two continents, Asia and Africa, where they've been doing a lot of work preparing countries uh, for rolling out vaccination programs. Cecilia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. And it's such a pleasure to hear from the high level panel as well as the uh, panel discussions. Um, coming from UNDP, I have to say it was such a pleasure to hear from um, Her Excellency Helen Clark as well. Thank you very much. Um, if I may, I think there are two questions. I think, uh, Ms. Clark, you mentioned that this is a pandemic of inequities. I think the first one is very clear. It's an inequity in terms of access to technology. And I think it's not just the technologies in terms of the finished products of vaccines or diagnostics or therapeutics. It's the um, access to the technology and the know-how to be able to increase manufacturing capacities. Now, there's been also a discussion that, you know, obviously there has to be greater um, focus on increasing manufacturing capacities across the globe so that we're better able, not just for this pandemic, but for future pandemics to be able to supply and have access um, to what is needed in terms of health technologies. And there's also a, a discussion on what we call global public goods. Now, I think this is where we come to the challenge of how do we define global public goods when we're still in the midst of talking, as um, Professor Carlos Correa has been saying, um, intellectual property rights and control over technologies. And I think, if I may, the question that I would ask um, the panel uh, would be, how do we initiate that discussion of global public goods? Is there a possibility of you know, policy coherence at the regional level to start with, um, to push such a discourse um, so that we get somewhere in terms of you know, an understanding of what could global public goods mean, not just in terms of the pandemic situation, but also in terms of overall um, you know, the ability to build resilience in our health systems? Um, if I may, uh, Mr. Moderator, second question. Please go ahead. 
you mentioned that you know UNDP has been working with countries in terms of preparing and supporting um, capacities on the ground to be able to roll out uh, you know sort of uh, the vaccination programs. What we've been trying to do is to understand the I guess the role and the potential of digital tools and solutions. I think a lot of the speakers before me have talked about, you know, digital transformation. Um, in UNDP, our experience has been to look at what were existing systems, say, for example, uh, logistics management systems for vaccines, and trying to pivot them very swiftly to look at delivery systems for COVID-19 vaccines, but more than that, um, to try to provide a more end-to-end -end and comprehensive system where we are able to have digitally enabled system for vaccine registration to delivery, um, to, you know, sort of real time, you know, sort of evaluation of the cold chain integrity uh, to real time um, information about, you know, who has, um, you know, been able to get a shot in the, in the arm and who hasn't. And I think this might then to, to us be a model, um, not just for digital transformation of the health system, but potentially the idea that, you know, this allows us to build robust government governance mechanisms for public health management, um, not just now, but for the future as well. And this also then allows us, I think, the ability to be able to monitor the negative um, impacts of the pandemic, not just in terms of access to the COVID um, health technologies, but also the lack of access um, to existing um, health um, priorities. And we talk about the fact that, you know, we are seeing the risk of 20 years of uh, gains in malaria uh, being negated. Um, we talk about the fact that we might see even greater numbers of people being um, affected by um, TB. I think it's something to the to the number of 6.3 million people are predicted, you know, to, to contract TB between 2020 and 2025. So I think the question would be, you know, is this a model in terms of uh, looking at um, digital transformation where we prepare now um, for the pandemic, but, you know, to have a longer term um, view, but also the longer term financing um, to ensure the sustainability of digital tools and solutions that we've put in place. Um, I, I think I'm going to stop here. I've taken up enough of time, but um, these were the two questions that I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask all the panelists to switch on their cameras so that we, uh, I, I think the uh, audience would like to also relate. Would anyone volunteer to answer the question, the one on, on how do we start this conversation on global or regional public goods? We have, I know, a discussion on the framework convention uh, on way. And secondly, the fact that the, digi uh, the digital tools will play a big role in, in the new uh, and reformed health systems. Anyone, please put up your hand. Annika, please, you go first. And then oh, Anne. Let me, let me, let me. Go to Ben. Then Carl <laughs> and help. Please go. Okay. I'm going to give a framework because I know we've got a lot of panellists who's going to provide really significant detail. Um, but I think I just want to re-emphasise with the global public goods and also the digital discussion that the resilience framework has been a good one for us to consider the implications of these by design, by intervention, which I mentioned before, but also from the framework that resilience, as we understand it, and I know the word's used an awful lot, um, but it's not just a return to normal. We deliberately took a view that it's about adapting, it's about innovating and evolving. And from this perspective, I think, um, as Chatham House would say, uh, and I think I've even authored something for them that had this in the title, we're moving from theory to lived experience. So we're moving from theory about global public goods and what they should be to lived experience about how some of that has panned out during the pandemic. And I think this is a really important point to be not only addressing our continued emergent um, conditions, but then also um, how these can be used as a framework and a foundation for building back better to use that frame, but how we innovate and evolve from this. Similarly for digital, I mean, the amazing use of data science, genomics, digital instruments for contact tracing, um, they come with challenges, as we know, and there is some Chatham House work that I'm happy to share that we've done around the use of artificial intelligence during the pandemic, and particularly in Africa. 
Um, but I think, again, this is a great foundation for looking at how we, we move forward with digital as a fundamental foundation in our systems. That's my framework. Thank you very much. Uh, Carlos Correa next, please. Dr. Correa. Yeah. Well, I would like to uh, reply or try to reply the, the first question and thank you, Cecilia, for making it. Uh, so nice to nice to see you in the context of this of this event. Uh, well, as, as it was suggested, the discussion is going now uh, is going on now in the World Health Assembly special session in relation to the so-called pandemic treaty. If there is a pandemic treaty or an instrument uh, like that. One of the issues that needs to be considered is the model for innovation. Innovation without access does not make sense. So the only way in which innovation makes sense in the context of pandemic or beyond that is when the outcomes of innovation become available and affordable. And this is what is underlying the concept of global public goods. There was a discussion in the past in the World Organization about what was called a research and development treaty. The aim was to change the model of uh, research and development, which is now based on the appropriation of patents and data exclusivity, so on. And then I think this, this is the, now uh, the time to initiate, to reinitiate, or to bring back the discussion about the model of research and development, how this can lead to global public goods and not just to technologies which are appropriated. At the regional level, I think there may be uh, some, uh, some possibilities also to look at this issue to, uh, to enhance cooperation in, among research institutions and other entities in order to ensure that this uh, objective is, is attained. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. Can I go to Anne Lindstrom, Dr. Reddy, and then, of course, to wrap up, uh, yeah, Ben, and then I'll go back to Dr. Ms. Clark to really give us the wrap up. So next, Anne, please. Um, yes, first on the on the digital tool, it's been really uh, fascinating to see how many, many countries have made a huge digital leap during the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines. You've seen in, in Nigeria, in Rwanda, in, in India, in Indonesia, many places that really have made it like a, a leap and also already are thinking about using these digital systems for routine, uh, uh, routine immunization uh, services later. However, it's a complex area and, and UNDP and UNICEF WHO, we've been in different pieces uh, trying to advise countries to use sustainable digital tools at the moment, uh, not do piecemeal whatever, but use building on what exists, what has proven to be effective, and that end-to-end -end perspective that can also be used for the future, which is, a, 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 I think, uh, a, a, the way to go, the only way to go. I think the return back from countries who have done that digital leap say it's absolutely essential for us to deliver the vaccines right now. Um, and I wanted to connect back on the global public health goods. I think it's starking to see that we're talking about COVID-19 vaccines with very high ambitions and billions and billions of doses. While we have an old public health, you know, emergency of malaria, of children dying still of malaria, we have a SAGE recommendation just coming out with the use, uh, recommending the use in high and medium transmission areas of this vaccine. But uh, the parallel to the COVID vaccines is striking. There is 10 million production uh, doses, but the needs are at least 10 times that, around 80, 100 million doses needed. It's not at the same scale. We should be able to fix this as well. This is a global public health good. So what can we learn from the COVAX um, you know, way that we worked? Uh, how can we increase and have a global collaboration also on this global public health good, which is malaria vaccines, um, and, and, and build on what we've learned during this pandemic? I think it's really, really crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Dr. Reddy? Yeah, uh, thank you. On the issue of uh, digital technologies, particularly in the area of health, uh, let me say that firstly, it is absolutely important that we utilize the full potential of digital technologies for advancing health and particularly health equity. And there it's absolutely essential that we recognize that the digital technologies that are being developed need to be context relevant. Because even when we take a thing like artificial intelligence, 
the algorithms that are developed only on selective data sets in some other parts of the world are not necessarily predictive or accurate in other parts of the world. So building capacity for development of digital technologies through development of adequate scientific methods, particularly which are multidisciplinary, is going to be important. So capacity building, national and regional, is going to be critical. And also promoting digital literacy among the various end users and potential beneficiaries is going to be important. Otherwise, we'll have uh, digital divides within countries as well. Lastly, I think it is absolutely important from the lessons that we have learned on vaccines that we should not let digital technologies as well become captive to proprietary science and be fettered by digital nationalism. I think we ought to recognize these also as important global public health goals. Thank you. Ben, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, just on, on digital health, I agree it is, is a complex area. Um, in terms of ADB, what we're looking at now and in our next 10-year health sector strategic framework, we're actually doubling down on digitalization of the health care. We, we consider it important leading into the COVID and now we see it as, as doubly important. Um, but it needs to be implemented uh, very carefully. Um, you know, I think most of the wealthy countries have have sort of stopped and started in terms of their digital implementation. It hasn't gone smoothly and we need to learn those lessons and do better for developing countries. So, you know, one thing is, is um, uh, accepting that a digital transformation of healthcare is similar to nation building. It requires all of those uh, ingredients. It needs strong leadership. It needs uh, workforce development considered throughout. And, and it needs to have interoperability, a data sharing platform, and a standards-based approach. Otherwise, it's not going to be successful. And at ADB, we've, we've, uh, we have produced uh, late last year a, a framework for approaching digital development of the health of healthcare. Uh, but we're also looking at a regional approach. We're talking about regions here. So we, we have established a, a, a standards and interoperability laboratory to try and make sure everyone is, is collecting the right kinds of information in the right kind of way so that we can make sense of it. Countries can understand what their population is. We can finally have denominators. And that hand in hand with health, we think about the other sectors. It's no good trying to implement uh, you know, fancy new technologies without a, um, a communications infrastructure. So those things need to be considered. We, you know, a, a sensible plan for implementation needs to be there. But I think we've learned all those lessons and we can run at speed now and, and uh, reap the rewards of, of this digital revolution. Thanks. Ms. Clark. I'd be very honored to go back to you just for you to give us your last thoughts and advice as we move forward. Yes, yeah, so my last reflection would be that I think of, of all the reform recommendations the independent panel made, uh, the toughest one of them to move ahead will be uh, to improve or, or redesign uh, the concept of Act A COVAX so that it relies less on market model and, and charity, in, in effect, and more comes at it from the angle of the supply and delivery and allocation of, of global public goods. So you're up against some quite uh, powerful forces here, but I think the battle's worthwhile. You know, WHO does have the medicines patent pool, which I think could um, do with a lot more uh, support and, and could perhaps be a, a building block for what needs to happen. But our panel felt that you know, we need to have end-to-end -end solutions going into, panel, into pandemics like this. We need the pre-negotiated platform with clear understandings as to how the uh, design, allocation and supply of goods uh, will be handled. And, and with any luck, if we could get it right, that would get us out of the, the queue jumping by high-income countries, the, uh, the intellectual property protection, which has been such a barrier uh, to rapidly scaled up uh, manufacturing. So I'd uh, really urge that some effort and thinking be put into that and hard enough at a global level, but maybe there's scope for the Asia Pacific regional level to be uh, innovating in this area. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Clark, for providing those really important uh, thoughts. And this brings us very nicely, just maybe a little over time, but I would like to, uh, we've come to the end of this regional conversation and the time allocated. I'd like to thank our all our speakers and our distinguished panelists for their extremely valuable contributions and for making this such a lively and interesting discussion. Your insights will add to the regional body of policy experience that, we, that are emerging from these extraordinary events. In a riskier world, we need to build back better from this pandemic. And definitely we're going to take some of all these thoughts that have been expressed here to see how SCAP can work with its member states as well as all its partners in uh, putting together a framework for, for really building back better, especially in ensuring equitable access to vaccine diagnostics and therapeutics. therapeutics. It's now my pleasure to invite uh, Ibu Armida Salciarlis Jabana to provide her reflections and closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Srinivas, for the moderation. And especially, I would like to recognize and extend our utmost appreciation and gratitude to Helen Clark, to uh, Dante, uh, Vice Minister Dante Saxono Buono, Secretary General Dato Lim, and the, all the distinguished panelists, Anne Lindstrand, Benjamin Coughlin, uh, Carlos Correa, Anneke Schmeider, and uh, Srinath Reddy. So for the excellent, excellent uh, presentation, uh, your thoughts and insight. I've been following yeah, without uh, any pause. So if I may, I would like just because I jotted down my my notes yet yeah, during during the all this excellent uh, presentation and discussion, if I may, I just would like to share what I uh, jotted down as uh, uh, key points from the discussion. Uh, although uh, I cannot, uh, of course, uh, cover all yeah, the very pertinent points. Um, the continuing pandemic, including the, 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 the recent occurrence of the variant of concern Omicron, is a reflection of inequitable access, uh, definitely, especially to vaccines, but more broadly as well, also a reflection of the inequitable access to diagnostics as well as uh, therapeutics. And all panelists or outline referred to solutions from uh, their respective different perspectives, very short term, mid term, medium term, as well as uh, uh, several ideas yeah, for regional cooperation to take forward. If I may just draw your attention to uh, the particular, because we've been quite concentrating on this vaccine issue. Yeah? Although again, yeah, this actually comes together the vaccine diagnostic and therapeutics. But on, in particular, the, the vaccine issue. Um, again, this issue of vaccine production, issue of vaccine distribution, procurement, and so on. Yeah? From existing, again, this inequality uh, arises from the existing distribution capacity which concentrate more or less yeah, in the advanced country, although uh, there are emerging hubs in the emerging countries. Uh, supply is there. Again, uh, one of the panelists uh, informed yeah, that uh, the supply is there in terms of the production capacity, but unfortunately the distribution is still uh, very highly skewed, so therefore the demand just doesn't match the, the, the supply. A uh, COVAX facility is certainly uh, contributes, but because of there are still this all these uh, shortcomings, and even uh, Helen Clark, right at your closing uh, remarks, uh, you you suggested the redesign of the COVAX facility. Uh, and another point is uh, one of the panelists also mentioned, which is quite interesting: the lack of prior agreement on the distribution of public goods during emergencies. Uh, there, there is just simply no agreement. And so therefore, everybody goes uh, on their own way. Second is on the issue of inequitable access. Uh, and again, all this drives driven by technology, inequitable access to technology, but technology is not technology per se, to include the know-how and also the 
financing, yeah, the funding uh, that goes with that. Uh, so how to increase uh, access uh, of all this across the globe. Yeah, this technology, this know-how, this uh, finance or financing. Third is the issue of the intellectual property rights. Again, this is quite technical. I'm not definitely, I'm not the expert of this, but several of the speakers uh, alluded to this. Uh, uh, the, the driving yeah, cause of all this is uh, issue of intellectual property rights. There are several attempts, again, as we know, but uh, attempts, unfortunately, haven't gone uh, that far. Yeah. So how to start the conversation on, on this? Yeah, apparently, it hasn't uh, gone that far. Uh, so therefore, can we discuss, yeah, again, several of the panelists suggested, can we discuss vaccine if, if it's not yet um, it's still difficult yeah, to come to the understanding uh, that vaccine is a global public? Can we have it in a more narrow in the sense that we, we can start this conversation at the regional, or even at the sub-regional or across several countries? So, for example, maybe at the sub-regional, we, we, we can come, uh, you know, a little bit uh, easier to this understanding that vaccine is this global public goods that goes with that and all the measures that can be taken. Fourth is certainly there are ample space yeah, and opportunities to decentralize the production of vaccines, therapeutics, as well as diagnostics to the new the so-called new hubs. Uh, definitely Asia Pacific uh, offers this opportunity and actually several countries are already or already yeah, are forging these alliances directly uh, government to the private sector uh, to certain uh, 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 what uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies and so on facilitated by for example that colleagues from ADP also shared and uh, within this this uh, the issue of production but also the issue of uh, uh, trading yeah? One of the panelists also alluded uh, the importance of uh, we, we should have a mechanism for trading the vaccine, again, aside from the COVAX facility. Fifth is uh, the need to also strengthen the healthcare system to take it a more holistic approach. And one suggestion from the panelists is to be so-called primary healthcare led. Yeah. So going to the direction of universal healthcare system, but we need to have the anchor. Uh, what is the anchor? The anchor is to be primary healthcare lab with all the details yeah, uh, that accompany that. And six, uh, last point that I would like to to uh, to share uh, from the discussion is the need to promote policy coherence. One of the panelists uh, mentioned this specifically, which I, I, I thought is very interesting, which is very true, uh, which gives space to the regional cooperation policy co coherence in the in the in the sense of regulatory system regulatory framework and so on and, and again yeah we can start from sub-regional approach or cross countries several countries and um, taken that further up at the regional and eventually ideally of course global but we we understand you know, if we would like to come up with something globally immediately it takes time yeah because to come to agreement Globally, so many countries is, is quite a challenge and very difficult. So with that, I close my remarks and maybe I hand over back to Sri Nifas. But again, my uh, our utmost appreciation and gratitude to all the speakers and panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm left with the extremely pleasant task of thanking all the panelists, speakers. Ms. Clark, thank you for staying right throughout. You've inspired us. And we had five extremely inspiring panelists and our executive secretary throughout also has been here on this very important issue. It's been one of the most stimulating uh, discussions as evidenced by very active presence on YouTube as well as MS Teams. And uh, suffice to say that all these ideas will really provide the meat for a lot of the proposals we'll make to member states in the coming commission session. Thank you to all for sparing time for being with us today. And we hope that we will see light at the end of the tunnel soon. So on behalf of SCAP, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. And we come to the end of this regional conversation. Thank you very much all.